So the second issue or problem with centralized finance is limited access. So what do I mean by that? Um, decentralized finance, I've said this and I'll say it many more times, is financial democracy. So it gives underserved groups uh, such as the unbanked and the underbanked the ability to actually operate in the internet of value. Okay, so you might think even within the US that, well, everybody's banked, but there are 18 million people in the US that are unbanked. Okay, so this is a, a very significant uh, problem and the impact for kind of the global economy is very significant. So essentially, DeFi gives consumers um, access to things that they might not have access to before. It's only a very small fraction of the global population has access to things like uh, credit or debit cards. Okay, so um, the products are restricted in centralized finance. And indeed, the centralized uh, financial institutions, it's their incentive to go for the most profitable slice of the population. They don't want to deal with the small entrepreneurs. They don't want to deal with the small uh, customer. So they'll increase fees or just not be welcoming of them. So in DeFi, it doesn't matter who you are. So there's no check. So remember I said that in centralized finance, there's the customer, the retailer, the banker, the regulator. There's no labels like that. Everybody is the same. They're peers. It's true that some peers might have more wealth than other peers, but it doesn't matter. Their transactions are treated identically to the transactions uh, for those that don't have as much uh, wealth. So there's other things that are kind of interesting, and this is very recent in the space of DeFi. Suppose you do have a bank account and you want to put your money to work and to earn some interest. You want to at least cover the rate of inflation. That's usually how it works. However, in most of the world right now, uh, interest rates don't cover the rate of inflation. So when you deposit your money at a bank, you get zero or a trivial interest rate that is well below the inflation rate. That means that you're losing real wealth. So DeFi offers the following possibility. Well, the question is why are the rates so low for deposits and why are the borrowing rates so high? And a lot of this has to do with all of the fixed costs of centralized finance. So if you get rid of the fixed costs, then it's possible to increase the savings rate and decrease the actual uh, lending rate. And this is exactly what's happening in decentralized finance. So if you, let's say, um, have a stable coin like USDC, you can deposit that into a liquidity pool, and we go into a lot of detail as to how this works uh, in the third course, Deep Fi, a Deep Dive. But you get a reward for actually doing that. So a savings rate. And these savings rates are much higher than the bank savings rates uh, today. So indeed, um, if you think about what happens in traditional banking, you put your money as a, a deposit and uh, you get paid very little interest 
but the bank takes that deposit and lends it out. And then the person that gets the loan might deposit some of that in another bank. And the cycle just continues, and this is called a money multiplier. Well, the same thing can happen in decentralized finance, where I deposit some money with a liquidity pool and one particular protocol, and then I get effectively a, a, a token from that that represents my share, my ownership of that pool. Well, I can deposit that token somewhere else and earn interest on it too. Okay, so again, we are disintermediating the bank and es essentially doing the same sort of thing that a bank is doing, having a money multiplier, but within this space. The bottom line here is that you're able to get a rate of return on your deposit that is not as risky as investing in Bitcoin or Ethereum and have a chance at a rate of return that meets or exceeds the rate of inflation. And again, this is open to anybody. You don't need to be a big player to actually do this. This is a very uh, simple uh, technology. So uh, there are many benefits um, to so-called yield farming. Um, however, you also need to be careful because many are making promises that seem unrealistic and it's always best to go with the protocols that have been out there a while and test it. So, um, so there's always uh, a risk uh, to take care of. So there's another idea in terms of limited access and it's called an initial DeFi offering. So we know what initial public offerings are. So initial public offerings are when a private company goes public on a stock exchange. And the stock might have been privately traded and those that are able to trade that stock are usually very high net worth uh, individuals. And there's a long process that you need to go after um, to actually be listed on a centralized stock exchange. And that is really not available to most companies. So a very small number of companies are listed on stock exchanges compared to the number of companies in general. And the reason is limited access. So why would you want to be listed? Well, it's a way to raise equity. It's, it's funding. So you can go to the bank, you can go and maybe sell somebody a bond, or you can offer equity. Well, uh, this is um, fairly straightforward uh, to do in DeFi. Equity has a different meaning. We've got equity, we've got tokens, and we'll go through all the details of this. But the idea with an initial DeFi offering is that we can actually launch a token uh, in a very straightforward way in a smart contract and uh, essentially set an exchange rate or a floor rate on that, uh, that token if we're the first liquidity uh, provider. This is very straightforward uh, to actually do. Um, so, so let's kind of go through uh, the mechanics of how this actually works. So let's say we've got a token, we'll call it TFT and it's got initial supply of 2 million. And what we can do is we can make the uh, initial DFT token worth uh, 10 cents. And we'll quote things in terms of USDC, which is linked and guaranteed by Coinbase um, in terms of its peg uh, to $1. So, so basically what you could do is to create an initial market where you've got a million DFT in a liquidity pool with 100,000 um, US dollar tokens. So basically uh, here's a situation where uh, if people are purchasing the DFT that will drive up the price um, and you immediately set the price given what you've contributed to the liquidity pool. 
So this is a very straightforward uh, mechanism and quite uh, popular uh, today. So uh, it, it allows for a startup to instantly come to market. So uh, if you think of coming to market with a product, it is so complicated. This is all done virtually. It's all within the smart contract. Um, there are some disadvantages, uh, and let me be upfront. And one disadvantage is that the floor that's set is somewhat artificial. So there could be price discovery that uh, suggests this token is now worth 10 cents. It really should be worth 5 cents. So, uh, so this is not perfect, but it just allows people to innovate uh, very quickly. So again, uh, this is part of the democratization of access. And IDOs are one of the components of that democracy. So this is a way uh, to deliver user access, to have an entrepreneur launch something very quickly, very cheaply, without the traditional baggage of hiring an investment bank and lawyers and all of the fees that are associated with that. 